great to be here. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pity that the students are not here, but hopefully we'll have a, we'll have a good conversation here still. We'll share the video with you. Yeah, yeah, sure. I'd be happy to share the video. I'll uh, put it up online as well. I'm afraid to ask the question how much time I have because <laughs> usually I violate that time. <laughs> Well, I think a lot. I'm not to be bored of listening to you. Okay, so, so uh, <laughs> I don't get easily tired when <laughs> presenting and talking about research, so that may be a dangerous thing to say, you know? <laughs> so let's target one hour. Okay, one hour, that's, that's a tough thing to target because I have material for the entire day, but we'll try to do it in one hour. Let's see. <laughs> let's see if it works. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to talk about. Uh, actually, this is uh, a title uh, that I used in the keynotes for the first time in Abu Dhabi. Uh, uh, in, eight, uh, in April. I was supposed to give a keynote in this uh, Semiconductor Research Corporation event uh, with Mubadala that was held in Khalifa University in April and I was late in answering uh, with my title uh, for my keynote and one of the SRC coordinators said okay your keynote should be titled Architectures for Intelligent Machines <laughs> and I said okay that sounds good actually uh, I don't need to come up with a title for my keynote now, and I had never used that title before, but it's missing something, which is intelligent at the beginning. So we want architectures for intelligent machines, but we want intelligent architectures for intelligent machines, I believe. In fact, we want to make the machines intelligent, uh, then we have to really make the architectures intelligent also. So this talk is really about how we are not designing architectures that are intelligent today, and where we can be if we actually rethink the design in different ways so that we can design more intelligent architectures that we need for an intelligent future. Hopefully this will become more clear uh, later on. Okay. Okay, basically... Interesting. Clearly I'm not intelligent enough to operate this machine, so... <laughs> okay. So basically uh, the problem is computing today is bottleneck by data and uh, I'll give you a lot of examples of this. Data is key for all applications that we're really interested in going forward. AI, machine learning, genomics, whatever you can think of, you will be bottlenecked by data. Important workloads are all data intensive. They require rapid and efficient real-time processing of large amounts of data, especially for things that we would like to make decisions quickly on. A lot of important problems in health, for example, you'd like to make a decision relatively quickly so that you can cut the loop for uh, uh, treatments. Or if you have a self-driving vehicle or self-flying vehicle, you really want to make decisions extremely quickly over there because uh, the consequences may be disastrous otherwise, right? And data is increasing on top of this. You can, we have access to vast amounts of data. We can generate more data than we can process. And these are some example applications that, are, that we know relatively well today, even though we don't deal with them very well. Like graph processing is at the forefront of a lot of applications like machine learning frameworks and we don't know how to deal with graphs really well, as I will hopefully show you later on. But we'll try. Okay, so data is a performance energy bottleneck in these applications. And if you look at the mobile end, we still have applications that are very, very data intensive as well. I will talk about these later on a little bit. I don't want to call this the lower end, because some of the highest performance processors, more, most efficient processors go inside these devices. And, but if you look at the applications that we're executing on these devices, they're all uh, data intensive also. And if you look into the future, uh, I, work, I do a lot of work in bioinformatics and genomics. Uh, data is increasing in some fields in an exponential rate because the cost of sequencing a genome, for example, is reducing uh, amazingly. So this is the cost curve for Moore's law. That's the curve we've been following. And this is the cost curve for uh, how much it costs to sequence a genome. So clearly it's much faster. It's reducing much faster. That's, as a result, people are sequencing genomes all over the world to understand what's happening. But we're not able to understand what's happening because we're limited by computation in this case. The technology has enabled us to sequence genomes and we can generate a lot of data, a lot more data than we can process. And I, this, is, this is an area that's close to my heart, so we do a lot of work on algorithms and architectures for genome sequencing. And essentially, we know how to do this really well and we have algorithms around here, but we don't know how to actually bridge the gap between the data that we generate and the algorithms that we use to analyze uh, that data. Again, data is a performance energy bottleneck. And especially if you want to look into the future where uh, these devices already exist, this is a simple device, nanopore sequencing device that you can buy for a thousand bucks or so. And you can generate, you can essentially sequence any genome with this one if you have the ability to do so, which is not that hard, I think. Uh, and this device essentially uh, generates a lot of data. 
Um, and today people are using this in Africa, for example, to sequence different genomes, different virus genomes. But what they're doing is because they don't have intelligence in the device itself, they're shipping all of that data to some data centers in Europe or US or wherever they may be, and they're dealing with that data over there. So they clearly cannot make real-time decisions, and they're expending a lot of energy across the entire world uh, to be able to do that. So I think we have a problem if we're not we're able to de do these, design these devices, taking advantage of the technology to do sequencing extremely well. But if we're not able to do, design these devices to do computing really well, then we really have a problem in the way we design computing architectures today, in my opinion. OK, if you're interested, I'd be happy to talk about this a lot more, but clearly not within an hour. OK, so another uh, demonstration of the fact that data is a performance energy bottleneck over here. And I will argue and hopefully show you that data today overwhelms modern machines. It overwhelms our storage and memory capability. It overwhelms the communication capability. And in the end, it overwhelms the computation capability. And it greatly impacts robustness, energy, performance, cost, and quality of service. Let's go back to the uh, basics. Basically, if you look at a computing system, it consists of three components, computation, communication, storage, and memory. And over decades and decades and decades, more than seven decades actually, we're heavily optimizing computing units. And computing units is, requires data to compute. And we have not optimized the other parts of the system. And as a result, we have a completely imbalanced system today. And that's why we, we don't have a good way of dealing with data. We're going to get back to this. Basically, we're doing computation only over here, whereas data is residing everywhere else in the system. We're really forcefully bringing the data from where it is into the computing unit, all the way into the computing unit. And this is happening at the micro scale here. This is a micro scale, it's a single machine, let's say. It's also happening at the macro scale. The example that I gave you with the nanopore sequencing device, in the macro scale, we're moving a lot of data around to some other computing units that are much farther away from the devices that are really generating the data. So I believe we really need to think or rethink the architectures that we're designing at the mac micro scale as well as the macro scale. Now, this talk is going to be about the micro scale because we have to start somewhere. And I believe macro scale need, needs to come also uh, to be much more efficient. So let's take a look at the ma micro scale. So this is my uh, cartoonish picture of an existing system, which I drew in 2008. And I, I don't change it because things don't change that much, as you can see. Uh, if you look at uh, this node, basically, the red parts are the parts that are doing computing. Everything else is dedicated to storing and moving data. And even in the red parts, most of the uh, pieces are really dedicated to storing and moving data, like the register files, L1 caches, interconnect. And we call these computing devices, but most of the resources are really dedicated to storing and moving data. Actually, if you do the calculations, more than 90% of the resources of a single node is de dedicated for data storage and movement. People are designing accelerators today for AI, for example. Most of them are buffers, interconnect, memory, and most of the node is still uh, dedicated to moving and storing data. And it's good to take a step back and Think about, we call these things computing devices, but most of the resources are not there for computation. Most of the store resources are there for data storage and movement. Okay, so I think I've already said this. Basically, data overwhelms modern machines today. I'll give you an example so from these workloads. We examined these workloads together with Google over the course of one and a half years. Clearly, you have uh, similar workloads in your mobile systems, and I think everybody uses these. Uh, even if you don't know if you're using this, somebody else is using running inference on your phone for you, for good or bad, I don't know. Uh, but there are privacy issues that we're not going to tackle in this talk. Uh, but basically, if you look over here, uh, we found out that more than 60% of the entire system energy is spent on data movement in these mobile devices running these workloads that people really care about. This shows me that there's something potentially wrong with the way you're designing uh, systems. So my axiom will be an intelligent architecture. If you want to build intelligent architectures, we need to handle data well, somehow. Now the question is, how do we handle data well? I believe there are three key things. First of all, we need to ensure somehow that the data doesn't overwhelm the components. Today it's overwhelming. Otherwise, we wouldn't see 60% of the energy spent on data movement. Right? Ideally, we would like to see 100% of the energy spent on efficient computation. We don't want to move data anywhere. OK, so to do this, I believe you need intelligent algorithms and intelligent architectures. In fact, in, uh, whole system designs that are algorithm architecture devices together, potentially specialized for different applications. Uh, on, on top of this, we need to take advantage of vast amounts of data and metadata that we have. Today, we're actually doing a very poor job with this one. We are not improving architectural and system level decisions based on what we've seen in the past. For example, this phone has been operating for five years in my hands or with me, and has not learned anything at all to change its algorithms. The memory controller algorithm that's running on this phone is exactly the same as the human design that designed it. 
even though it's seen five years of information, it's not changing its actions. This is very different from an intelligent being. Right? And our, we are intelligent beings. We learn, hopefully, from our past. We are changing our actions, but this thing is not changing its actions. It's a rigid policy that's inside it. And it's full of rigid policies. We'll get back to that. Uh, okay, and that's true for, I think, all of the accelerators that we have as well. Uh, and the next one is, I think, we need to understand and exploit properties of different data so that we can really take advantage uh, of uh, the, these properties to improve the algorithms and architectures in various metrics. And this will become more clear when we talk about it. But for example, if we can say you can, this data you can keep secure, this data you don't need to keep secure, then you can actually ha open up a design spaces that we are not taking advantage of today. Okay, so I think corollaries based on what I've just said are these three things. I, I think I'll, uh, I'll deconstruct current architectures in three ways. I think architectures today are terrible at dealing with data. They're designed to mainly store and move data versus compute. compute. Essentially, they're called computing architectures, but they're not doing computing most of the time. And this is because they're processor-centric. Their paradigm is processor-centric design as opposed to data-centric design. And we will talk about that hopefully a lot. Uh, the second thing is, uh, corollary is, architectures today are terrible at taking advantage of vast amounts of data that's presented to them, that's available to them over years and years, even over microseconds. Right? And they, they're designed to make simple decisions, uh, ignoring lots of data. And this is because they're really uh, making human-driven decisions as opposed to data-driven decisions. And I think we really need to change the design paradigm to make more data-driven decisions as opposed to human-driven decisions. And the last one over here is where uh, architectures, they are terrible at knowing and exploiting different properties of application data. They, they're not aware of it, first of all, most of the time. And as was, because they're not aware of it, they cannot exploit it as well. They're designed to treat all of the data the same. As a result, they make more component-aware decisions, like cache-aware, memory-control-aware decisions, as opposed to the data characteristic-aware decisions. What is really, what can I do to this data that is, not, uh, that is not considered in the design of these different components today? Hopefully, this will become more clear. So my goal is to really cover these three different directions and we can spend the entire day doing so, but probably we don't have the entire day. Although I have the entire day, I think, but <laughs> maybe you don't. So I'm going to pick and choose different parts of it, because uh, it, it, things that go into each of these are uh, a lot, in my opinion. I'm going to spend most of the time over here, because we've done the most work over here first. So I'll talk about data-centric or memory-centric architectures. Uh, and this is not very designed very well. But basically, these are some properties that uh, uh, I believe data-centric architectures should possess. First of all, we should really process data where it resides, minimize data moments, uh, treat data as the first-class citizen, uh, and, and process the data where it makes sense. This, is, this leads to processing in and near memory structures. And these memory structures are very general, and I believe we should also have communication structures over here. We should really process data while, it, while it's moving, while it's stored. I'm going to talk about that. The second one is also very important. If you really want to, uh, if data is really important to you, and you want to make quick decisions on the data, we really need to enable low latency and low energy access to data. If you don't do that, then uh, basically you'll, you'll spend lots of time waiting for data. Actually, I'm going to prioritize this one and talk about this briefly at the expense of maybe 10 minutes or so, if you don't mind. Uh, because this is very important, in my opinion, going into the future. We really want low latency. Latency is the cause of a lot of problems that we have in systems today. Low latency, uh, high latency actually leads to high energy as well. So these are actually a couple of things. Uh, on top of this, we want low cost data storage and processing. I think this is really important, but I'm not going to talk about that. And there are techniques that are really interesting going forward. And we want to uh, design, uh, data, manage data intelligently. And I, I'll touch upon different parts of this later on. But let's start with this low latency and low energy data access a little bit. Uh, so if you look at the way we've designed memory for a long time, I'm going to talk about main memory. Uh, and how different metrics relate to each other. I'm going to uh, cover uh, the 18 years of memory design and how much different metrics have improved. These are three major metrics that you normally try to improve when designing memory. And we're very, very heavily capacity focused. And I actually look at the DDR-based systems uh, that, are, that are most common in each year. And if you look at this graph, capacity has improved by 128x over the last 18 years. Actually, we're having difficulties with capacity right now because of reliability problems. I will talk about that briefly to motivate intelligent controllers. Bandwidth has improved, not as much as capacity, because these systems are not designed for bandwidth. Although bandwidth is a good consideration, uh, it's still lagging a little bit behind capacity, because capacity cost per bit is the major design point that you have in main memory today. 
Of course, you could, this doesn't include 3D architectures, which we will hopefully talk about. 3D architectures actually give you a jump in terms of bandwidth. And as the 3D connectivity increases, your bandwidth is also increasing. I don't believe it's going to be as much as capacity going forward. Uh, but still, it's not that. And then it is sometimes a function of, uh, actually always a function of how much uh, money you throw at it, right? How much money and power. But uh, my point is basically, if you look at latency, what, would the, what does the curve look like? Any guesses? Yeah, I see flat, basically. I, I always ask this question, I think people are always saying flat, which is flat, basically. It's 30% 30, 30 improvement in 18 years is not a good achievement, I think, especially if you want to design real-time systems uh, that can operate on data intelligently. So basically, main memory latency remains almost constant. Uh, I can talk about this graph for the entire day also, but let's leave it at that. So if you look at it, uh, give it a closer look, some, uh, some of the latencies are actually increasing. And clearly, a lot of applications uh, are latency critical. Actually, in many of these applications, latency, bandwidth, uh, capacity is a very interesting mix uh, in efficiency. So sometimes they're limited by bandwidth, sometimes they're limited by capacity, sometimes they're limited by latency. You cannot ignore any of them in these data intensive applications, actually. In one application particularly, maybe we can ignore some aspects, but if you want to build somewhat general purpose system that covers a wide variety of applications that are similar, you still need to uh, cover uh, all metrics. So long memory latency in these applications lead to a performance bottleneck. That's true for these applications also, especially inference is very important over here. And actually, if new DRAM types increase latency. This is an interesting study that we published at Sigmetrics uh, this year, where we examined nine different memory types, DRAM types, that are state of the art and more than 100 different workloads. And we wanted to understand the interactions between them. And if you look at some of the new DRAM technologies, they make the trade-off of increasing memory latency uh, for getting higher bandwidth. And many applications actually cannot take advantage of the higher bandwidth, but they're affected by the latency. So you actually lose performance in some applications because latency increases, and you have to rewrite your application completely if you really want to take advantage of bandwidth, and that's not an easy task in some applications that are especially dependent on a lot of data processing. So if you're interested, I'd be happy to talk about that. Uh, and we actually release a lot of the source code related to this, you can find online. Okay, so main memory latency is a significant limiter of system performance and energy efficiency, and it's becoming increasingly so with higher memory contention, multi-core and heterogeneous architectures and accelerators. It exacerbates the bandwidth need, it exacerbates the predictability and quality of service problem. It also increases processor design complexity because people try to incorporate a lot of latency hiding and latency tolerating techniques in both general purpose processors as well as accelerators, like heavy multi-threading in GPUs, for example, uh, heavy auto order execution, caching, prefetching, the huge hierarchies that we have, they're all there to tolerate memory latency. And when they don't work, they don't work. They're there for, they're basically wasting a lot of things. Even, if when, they, even when they work, they actually have a lot of complexity. We're going to talk about a vicious cycle, basically, because of the memory problem. We're adding a lot of complexity to our systems, and that complexity is increasing our energy waste. And we're in this vicious cycle of uh, energy waste uh, because the data is far away, and we keep uh, increasing our energy waste. I'll, I'll talk about that more uh, in uh, soon. This is actually a slide from uh, Barker mentioned that I graduated from UT Austin. This is a slide that I used in 2003 uh, in my PhD proposal and I still keep it this way. These are the major uh, conventional latency tolerance techniques. Caching, prefetching, multi-threading, auto-order execution. And my PhD thesis was about uh, developing a technique called running head execution that's a much more efficient alternative to auto-order execution uh, without the heavy com complex structures auto-order execution has. So that was very processor-centric. But if you look at all of these techniques, none of them really fundamentally reduce memory latency. Memory latency is there, and these techniques are trying to reduce it, either hide it, or reduce it from the processor's perspective. So it's a very processor-centric thinking. I think we need to really change the paradigm to think more data-centric. So if you think data-centric, you really go and change, uh, reduce the latency at the source of the data, which is really DRAM in this case. But that's true for storage also. I think we need to do this for storage devices too. So basically, there are two major sources of latency and efficiency. One is modern DRAM is not designed for latency. Main focus is capacity. And modern DRAM latency is determined by worst-case conditions and worst-case devices. Uh, essentially, much of memory latency is actually unnecessary, and I'm going to talk about that uh, more, less so this one, although this is also very important, I think. How do you rethink the microarchitecture and architecture of DRAM such that your main cost is not capacity? You give up a little bit of capacity, but you improve latency greatly, and we have a lot of work in that area that I will reference, but I'm not going to talk about it in detail. So basically, the goal is to reduce the memory latency at the source of the problem as opposed to at the processor or accelerator. So why is memory latency so high? Essentially, uh, 
we're, today we're not accessing memory with the true access latencies that we can access it with. We're accessing memory with access latencies that are specified in a paper. That's called a data sheet. And here yeah, your memory control is obeying that data sheet. And uh, this data sheet doesn't reflect the true DRAM device latency because there is, there is a lot of variation in latency across DRAM chips, within a DRAM chip, and across operating uh, conditions. So if you look at DRAM latency, let's look at the process manufacturing variation. You have different types of DRAM, and you have variation in terms of latency. Some DRAM chips have to be operated at high latency because uh, they don't have a lot of charge, let's say. Uh, that's an ana analogy, of course. Some cells are not strong enough. So you need to give them enough time so that the voltage settles. Right? Whereas some DRAM chips, you can operate them at very low uh, latency, uh, and you, can, you don't get any errors. And we've actually seen this in many, many devices. So, and if you actually make the system aware of this, you can gain a lot of performance. I'll give you some results very quickly, some basic results. Even in real systems, without a lot of changes to the system. And within a chip, you have variation also. Some cells are strong, some cells are weak in terms of latency. If you actually take advantage of that variation, you can get even more. But today what we do is we choose some standard latency that's high and we have a single set of parameters so that pretty much all of the DRAM devices that are manufactured are acceptable. As a result, you can maximize your yield threat. I, don't, I think this may be a good approach to accept the devices, but we should not use only a single set of timing parameters for all of the devices. Essentially, the idea in adaptive latency DRAM in this paper that we published is that, basically. You optimize DRAM timing parameters online as opposed to having a single set of timing parameters that is statically determined. And this is slightly intelligent architecture, I think. It's not completely intelligent, clearly, but slightly intelligent. Uh, so if, I'm not going to go into the details, but we have a way of really getting a reliable uh, latency parameters for different DIMMs and different, uh, different DRAM modules and different uh, temperatures. And while the program is executing, the system monitors the DRAM temperature and uses the appropriate timing parameters for each different chip. And that's the idea over here. And this can be done, I think, with relatively low cost. Uh, and we actually analyze a lot of chips with our infrastructure. This is our FPGA-based testing infrastructure for memory. Uh, we built a lot of these infrastructures to understand memory-related issues. We actually open source this infrastructure. Other people are using this infrastructure right now in academia. I'll hopefully get a chance to talk about some of those works that other people had to, uh, to use this infrastructure. And if you're interested in using this infrastructure to test memory, we'd be happy to support it. We're actually already supporting it. Uh, and people can download the source code and do whatever they want with it also. So basically, using this infrastructure, we analyzed 115 DIMMs, which is almost 1,000 chips. Uh, and the latency reduction, reliable latency reduction that you get on average at 55 degrees Celsius, uh, which is lower than clearly the 85 degrees Celsius or 95 degrees Celsius that the, um, the, worst, case, uh, the worst case supports, is significant. Basically, you can reduce the read latency at 30, by about 30% and write latency by about 55%. And this is without doing a whole lot of work. We're not even changing the architecture significantly in this case. And there, there's a lot more data in the paper. So the impact of this on real systems is significant. On memory intensive applications, basically we get about 14% performance improvement in multiple, multiple applications. And clearly memory non-intensive applications don't get affected. Essentially, but these are real system results, basically. We don't, we, we don't even change anything in the system. We, we just adjust the timing parameters to the parameters that we know are good uh, in that operation mode. So clearly, this also uh, reduces your energy, but I'm not going to go into the details of this. So if you're interested, there's, uh, I'd be happy to talk about this more. Uh, okay, so I think uh, pulling, uh, pulling a step back, basically, this is really about taking, tackling the fixed latency mindset. The way we're treating memory structures today are, uh, is, is not very optimized. Reliable operation latency is actually very heterogeneous across many things, temperatures, chips, parts of a chip, different voltage levels. You can keep adding to this, actually. Uh, the idea that we've been following is to have an intelligent controller, intelligent mechanism that dynamically during operation finds out the lowest latency it can reliably access a memory location with uh, so that you can actually reduce the latency significantly or you can get some other benefits. And I've given you an example which is adaptive latency DRAM. It's, it doesn't even do this online profiling, but we have controllers that can do the online profiling, and I'd be happy to talk about that separately. They can, they can also trade off between voltage and latency, like this Voltron work over here. And this can also enable other benefits. So once you actually get rid of the fixed latency mindset, uh, we found out that you can actually generate true random numbers in DRAM by, cha by making changes to the memory controller. The idea is very simple. Uh, you reduce the latencies, some cells start failing, uh, some cells are relatively robust, but you reduce the latencies to a level that some cell, uh, you figure out the failure probabilities of different cells. Some cells actually fail randomly, 
at 50% rate. And you figure out which cells those are, and you use them as random number generator, uh, generators. So you can build a relatively uh, high throughput, low latency random number generator by actually changing your latencies and understanding which cells actually fail random. And I'd be happy to talk about that too. We've released a lot of uh, that work. So basically, uh, I think we would like to find out source of latency heterogeneity and exploit them to minimize latency or create other benefits. Okay, the one example of this is if you can actually uh, understand your latencies of different cells, uh, you can have a software transparent design that reduces latency. The memory controller dynamically divides memory regions into different latencies and uses lower latency for regions without slow cells and higher latency for other regions. And again, we did a lot of characterization of real system devices with this. This is an example of a real chip. These are real profiles from real uh, DRAM chips. So for example, this DIMM uh, uh, can operate, most of its cells can operate reliably at 7.5 nanoseconds. Whereas we're, today, the standard says you should be using 13 nanoseconds to access it. So it can almost tell the latencies uh, for most of the sets. And if the memory controller is aware of this, of course, clear, this, not, this distribution is different for different DIMMs, uh, as you can see over here. And the benefits you get if, you, if the memory uh, controller actually exploited, exploit this difference is significant. For that DIMM, where 99% of the cells can be operated at 7.5 nanoseconds, we get about 20%, almost 20% performance improvement across uh, a reasonably small set of workloads, let's say. But this is really consistent across different workloads. And this is closer to the upper bound where you can operate all cells at 7.5 nanoseconds. That's the idea. Okay. Okay, so we did a lot of work, uh, but I'm not going to bore you with more works over here. Latency, uh, I can talk about this latency itself for the entire day. Uh, but I'll just uh, show you some of the recent papers. So we actually showed that you, uh, by exploiting this latency reliability trade-off, you can build a physical and clonable function in DRAM that's relatively fast and that's not subject to, that's actually relatively predictable in terms of latency, uh, how, how fast you can evaluate it. As I said, you can actually do this with uh, true, you can generate true random numbers. And there are other ways of actually uh, reducing latency. These are actually changing the DRAM structure uh, a little bit, which I'm not going to talk about. So if you actually go and change the DRAM structure itself, you can get a lot higher benefits. And refresh is something that we will hopefully talk about in a little bit. Okay, but basically the takeaway is, I believe we can reduce memory latency significantly with a change of mindset. Our mindset today is fixed latency. Let's get rid of that mindset. Let's make it variable latency somehow. And I believe you need, if you really want to do that, you really need intelligent controllers to reduce that latency because you need an intelligent controller that keeps profiling your memory. Okay, that's all I want to say about latency. Any questions? Is this interesting or boring? It looks really good. Okay, I see. <laughs> yes, please. Uh, what about the aging? I mean, so uh, the, the, the older the memory gets, uh, over the yes. aging. Yes, absolutely. So uh, in the longer term, it will age. In the short term, we did a lot of short term studies like months. In, within, within the course of months, we don't see effects of aging. But I believe in the long term, uh, you see effects of uh, aging, meaning that you need to increase the latency slightly, especially if you get rid of margins. Uh, and uh, for that, I think you, you really need, that's why we actually pro propose this profiling mechanism online. Once in a while, you profile, you figure out the latencies, and then you increase the latencies as needed uh, based on aging. So that's a, that's a clear, really important concern. Yes? Is that, is that the application specific? Or will it have to depend on the intensity of the data, for example, the frequency of the data? Uh, you mean the latency optimization that we do? So uh, actually, that's a great question. In, in the works that I showed you over here, they were not application specific. They were basically understanding the memory device itself and reducing latencies. But if you actually uh, know your application, you can take advantage of it more. I will talk about that later. For example, we, we've done uh, some works recently on neural networks, deep neural networks. And in the application, uh, some, uh, some parts can tolerate latencies uh, a lot more, some parts cannot tolerate latencies a lot more. So it can actually reduce the latencies even more if the, if the application can actually tolerate the errors that are caused by it. So what I described here so far was not application specific, but you can do even more if you actually take advantage of the application. Yes? So uh, I'm not very familiar with the theorem, but I'm uh, an SRM designer, so sure. I know all the way I think the, uh, the six sigma you know, design point for SRAM. Yes. Because for single failures, like yes. the amount of data you have or cells that you have to design uh, for all these probabilities of single, you know, sure. single device to fail. So with the same talking, I know you, 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 you pick one device and you do the testing, but device to device variation, uh, and then uh, you know, all these uh, kind of design time optimization 
uh, scheme where we, you, you have the designer, you need to make it to work, yeah. and all kinds of uh, scenarios. So we, what you're suggesting is moving from that into more probabilistic, or the controller need to be intelligent. Basically, the controller does all of that uh, dynamically, yes. It needs to be for each chip. For each chip, exactly. For yes. each chip to configure it that this one will run like at uh, 7.5 nanoseconds exactly, versus yes. uh, all, all of them need to run at the lowest one. Exactly, yes. Exactly. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, this is not only for DRAM. I mean, SRAM can take advantage of that even more, you know, critically because it's sitting next to the processor. Yeah, I agree with you. I think the general mindset is really uh, about any type of memory. It could be applicable to any type of memory. We did DRAM because we had the infrastructure and we, knew about, we know about DRAM a lot more, for sure. I think you can do it in SRAM also. I gained a lot of benefit as well. In fact, we, we, uh, there, there is some work that uh, was done for flash memory as well that was published recently in Micro. That's not from us, but they also showed that s with similar techniques, you can reduce the flash latency significantly. I mean, we tried to do that in the processor with dynamic processing. Exactly. Yeah. But then it's still like kind of how, how do you do the testing? How do yeah. you like sell the chip? Yeah. Like at the end, you need to sell the chip with this performance mm -hmm. and yeah. to achieve this yield. So it, you know, it's started, but really never kind of uh, mm -hmm. take advantage of it fully uh, on the chip level because of the infrastructure and the mm -hmm. marketplace kind of uh, infrastructure to support this kind of dynamic mm -hmm. voltage scaling for SRAM. For SRAM, I see, yeah. yeah. I think with DRAM, the latencies are much longer, so they're, they're, the benefits could be higher, for sure. But we can talk about it more. There are also clearly <laughs> business-related issues here. That's right. yeah. So what's the impact of the ECC, so Eric, correct yeah. on long yeah, yeah, absolutely. So that's a great question. Actually, uh, a lot of the online profiling mechanisms that we propose rely on ECC because you need to actually uh, reduce latency and ECC acts as a cannery so that you can figure out that you're doing something wrong and you should increase. So ECC, I believe, is necessary to be able to do online profiling. That's the conclusion we came to in the end. Without ECC, it's very, very difficult to do online profiling. You have to play with something else like voltage, but then you run into some potential reliability issues. And ECC is all, all already being added to DRAM chips. All, all of the LPDDR chips have ECC right. today. And going forward, I think, for, for reasons, other reasons, of course, manufacturers will add ECC. Yes? Does DRAM have redundancy like SRAM or no? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of redundancy inside the DRAM chip. Like you roll level redundancy and column level redundancy so that you can right. correct for errors. Exactly, exactly. I think, I think uh, this, now you have the mindset, right? It's not the fixed latency. You have all of this infrastructure inside it. How can I use it for? Uh, reducing latency. Absolutely, I agree with that. The redundancy? Not today. Uh, there are proposals to do it at the memory controller level, but uh, traditionally it has been done uh, statically. Uh, yeah, uh, the redundancy exploitation. But I think that it's a good idea to do it dynamically. You, you get rid of a weak cell, for example, and map it to a strong cell. Okay. okay. These are great questions. They're lengthening my talk. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> as long as you're fine with Better it. Better stop your watch. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Better stop your watch. Okay. So I'm going to actually spend more time on this one, which is uh, really processing data where it resides. But I had to do this because I think this is really, really important. And they're, they're synergistic in the end. You can process data where it resides. If it's high latency, it's high latency. Why don't you reduce the latency over there also? These are really orthogonal optimizations. Okay, I also call it processing data where it makes sense uh, in the end because it, uh, you, you want to, if the goal is to minimize data moment, you'd really like to have the ability to process data wherever the data is. Uh, so in memory computation, it's clearly an old idea. The earliest general purpose papers were written in late 1960s. Actually, Harold Stone has a paper from uh, in 1970 in IEEE transaction computers called A Logic in Memory Computer. It's a beautiful paper. It actually talks about uh, doing general purpose processing in memory, but it's not been implemented over decades and decades and decades and decades. Today, I think we're in a special place where we're having a lot of difficulties at the low level. Where the technology is pushing us to do something different because, as I will show you, DM scaling is at je jeopardy. We're having a lot of reliability issues, and people are actually very interested in looking at new memory architectures today. Part of it is because DM scaling is problematic, and part of it is there are emerging technologies that are really interesting like memristors that can potentially replace DM. So industry is much more open to new memory architecture. In fact, there are startups that are examining things like processing in memory today. Uh, you can see that there's 3D stack memory uh, with controllers, and uh, also people are looking at interesting architectures that are limited in terms of uh, processing. So there's a huge push from technology today that are, that's pushing us to do something different. And uh, I'm going to talk about that part first, and then we're going to talk about the pool from uh, applications as well. 
And uh, it's, it's always interesting because uh, it's, it's, uh, it, we're giving this talk in 2019. We can look back, right? Uh, when, when, uh, when we were first started looking at uh, these DRAM scaling issues, it was around 2011 or so. And I was invited to give this talk at the International Memory Workshop, which was which attended by a lot of memory companies. And this was my paper over there. And uh, people empathized with this a lot. Uh, but we didn't have really a lot of evidence in terms of the memory scaling issues, right? In this paper, we argue that memory scaling is really important. And there, there are issues that are real. But now I can talk about the data that we collected after that. So this is data that we collected together with Facebook over the course of one and a half years. Basically, we analyzed all of the memory errors in all of the servers uh, in all of their data centers. And they do a good job of recording all of that. And we were able to analyze it. And this is the correlational study that we did. Basically, we found out that the, uh, there's a very strong positive correlation between the chip density that's employed in a server, this is the DRAM chip density, and the server failure rate because of the memory errors it's getting. And we analyzed these errors. There's a lot of analysis that I'm not going to go into. But the takeaway is, as we cram more cells in a single chip, cells start interfering with each other. There are a lot of effects of noise. Cells become smaller also, and they become more vulnerable. As a result, your memory reliable to reduce this. And this is really a scaling problem in the end. And there are a lot of other studies as well that are published that are similar. Uh, ours is one of the later ones, let's say. And if you're interested, I'd be happy to talk about that. And we also, as I mentioned, uh, design infrastructures that are at the lower level to actually study these issues. Essentially, these are more controlled infrastructures where you have a memory controller infrastructure in an FPGA. And we can understand different issues like refresh, retention times, latencies, different reliability issues. And we actually developed this infrastructure. As I said, this is already open source and other people are using it. So one of the scaling, actually, I believe the biggest scaling issue in DRAM, is, which is a charge-based memory, is data retention. Uh, you need to refresh dynamic memory for sure. And uh, that refresh rate increases as you reduce the size of the cell because your charts become smaller. And if you want to cram more cells in a given chip, you, you have many, many rows to refresh. Uh, we, want, we want to tackle that question basically. That's why we built this infrastructure. We want to understand, understand these data retention issues. Do we really need to refresh every cell every 64 milliseconds? At that time, it was 64 milliseconds. Today, actually, you need to refresh every 32 milliseconds, sometimes every 16 milliseconds. So our refresh is becoming worse today. But uh, uh, when we did the, uh, these earlier studies, it was 64 milliseconds. And then, uh, clearly, because of the process manufacturing variation, retention time profile is very heterogeneous as opposed to homogeneous. And this is the heterogeneity that you see. This is actually almost to scale. Basically, most of the cells you don't need to refresh as frequently. You can get away with refreshing at 4x lower the rate. This means that you can reduce the refreshes by almost 75% if this is true. Right? And that gets rid of the scale problem. Of course, to be able to do this, you need to have intelligent controller because it's not as easy. Because this profile is not static. It's clearly dependent on the location of the cell, depending on which cell it is, but it's also dependent on the data that's stored in the cell and the cells around it because you have a lot of capacitive coupling that happens between the cells and the voltage levels in the cells clearly affect that capacitive coupling. And what is worse is, and this is one of the worst scaling issues in my opinion in DRAM, is depend on time. Now what does this mean? Uh, you can test DRAM at this point uh, right now and a cell can maintain data for 100 seconds. Okay, you test it 101 seconds later, it maintains data for only 8 milliseconds. This happens in DRAM. It's, 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 uh, it's a uh, phenomenon called variable retention time. And what happens is charge gets trapped randomly to a random process inside the access transistor. And the capacitor charge uh, drains very quickly when charge gets trapped. It's, it was very well known, but as, as circuits scale to smaller sizes, this, this becomes a much bigger problem. And this is exactly the reason why DRAM manufacturers are adding ECC into the devices. So if you really want to exploit this profile, you need to take into account all of those issues, which means that you really need to have an intelligent controller that does this profiling so that you can reduce the refresh rates.